A preview of Reversing Hermon, Session 5, The Watchers and Jesus Genealogy. Learning objectives for this session include the following. By the end of this session, we shall be able to describe the Enochian template, which we shall see shortly. Explain why Matthew mentions four women in Jesus' genealogy. And thirdly, to recount the stories of Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. By way of preview, we shall learn how Jesus undoes what the Watchers did by being born in the lineage of fallen sinful human beings, by reversing the effects of the Watchers' sin in real human lives, and by exalting fallen women as ancestors of the Divine Messiah. In Matthew chapter 1 we read, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth. And then David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And in verse 16, Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ or Messiah. Now, regarding the background to Matthew's Gospel, we note that Matthew nowhere directly quotes from the book of First Enoch, and he does not include righteous women such as Sarah, Rebecca, or Rachel. Being a Second Temple Jew, however, he was familiar with the Enochian story and he mentions these women who illustrate the Enochian template. Why did he choose these four women? Well, probably to connect Jesus' coming with God's grace for Gentiles and sinners, to connect him with First Testament narratives, in particular God's covenant with Abraham, and his covenant with David, and to prepare the readers for Jewish mission to Gentiles, described in chapter 28. And, of course, to frame the genealogy within the Enochian template. Before the great flood, certain divine beings left their proper domain in the air violating the human domain on earth. They saw, took, and mated with human women, fathering giants who became demons, and then taught women seductive cosmetics and taught all human beings astrology, warfare, sorcery, drug usage, and idolatry. Now, there are many sources of human evil. It began with the devil's defection in Eden, and then our first parents' disobedience. Within a few generations, there was the watcher's illicit teaching, and then later demons parading as gods. These remain to this day as spiritual rulers over nations, whereas Jesus said that most human evil comes from within our fallen human heart. Even Christians can be tempted by Satan, 
and we are all misled when we succumb to our own personal lust. Here is what we read in the book of Enoch, chapter 6. It came to pass when the children of men had multiplied, that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of the heaven, saw and lusted after them and said, Come, let us choose wives from amongst the children of men and beget us children. And then in chapter 8, Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them, and bracelets and ornaments, and the use of antimony, and the beautifying of the eyelids, and all kinds of costly stones. And there arose much godlessness, and they committed fornication, and became corrupt in all their ways. The watchers taught enchantments or sorcery, root cuttings, resolving of enchantments, astrology, the constellations, knowledge of the clouds, signs of the earth, sun and moon. Now, in each of the four women's history, she employs one or more of these illicit arts, beautification and seduction suspected or illicit sexual encounters, interaction with angel messengers, questions about their children's paternity and the nature of their offspring. In Genesis chapter 38, we meet Tamar. Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira, from the city of Adulma, a Canaanite capital. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Er. After two of Judah's sons had died, and Tamar was not given to the third son, she covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance to Enaim city. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside. He went into her and she conceived by him. How does this story fit the Watcher's template? First, Judah had consorted with a Canaanite woman, which was forbidden to Israelites. Tamar herself used a veil to seduce Judah, taking the role of a sacred prostitute. And as the watchers of old, Judah saw, took, and mated with a woman to whom he had no right. And she conceived and bore a mixed son, and named him Er, which is the same root of the Aramaic, Hebrew, and Mesopotamian words to remain awake, to be a watcher. We learn about Rahab in Joshua chapter 2. Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. The king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. 
But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said to the men, I know that Yahweh has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For Yahweh your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now, how does Rahab fit the watcher's template in the city of Jericho? First, she was possibly named after Rahab, the Mesopotamian monster. She was a seductive sex worker, and Jericho the city was under the Cherub ban because of the Anakim giants in the region, Haram being the root of Mount Hermon. And in 625, the spies are called angels, Melachim in Hebrew, and in James chapter 2, called Angeloi, angels in Greek, as in First Enoch, because they left their own camp to enter a pagan city. Now we meet Ruth. Emelech, the husband of Naomi, died and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Chilion died. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Well, later in the story, she learns about a relative named Boaz, who could possibly buy back Naomi's lost land. So Ruth went down to the threshing floor and did as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then Ruth came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. How does the story of Ruth fit the watcher's template? First, Ruth was a Gentile from Moab. God had forbidden that Israelites have affairs with Moabites. For Moab was known for its illicit sex. In fact, it was a people descended from incest between Lot and one of his daughters, and was involved in holding orgies, in which some Israelites had become involved and was an idolatrous country, worshipping a god named Chemosh. And then Ruth used seductive tactics with Boaz, uncovering his feet. This is a figure of speech called metonymy, meaning the lower part of the body. <clears throat> and her eventual children would be mixed, Israelite, Moabite, who, according to law, should be excluded from Israel. However, Boaz, as a family redeemer, reverses the Enochian template, making of Ruth an ancestor of King David. Now we come to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 
In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. David was now old enough to be in his midlife crisis and therefore remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was beautiful, seductive. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, a Gentile? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Why in Matthew's genealogy is she called the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Matthew did not tell her name. Well, we read earlier that Judah's wife was called Bathshua, which means Shua's daughter. Interestingly, in the book of First Chronicles, Bathsheba herself is also called Bathshua, in this case meaning Shua's granddaughter. Thus Bathsheba was likely a Gentile. We do note, however, that one Hebrew manuscript, the early Latin Vulgate translation, and the early Greek Septuagint translation converted this name back to Bathsheba. Well, how does Bathsheba fit the Watcher's template? At this time, Israel was at war with Ammonites. Ammonites were also descended from incest, were enemies of Israel and worshipped false gods. And Uriah himself is called a gibor, meaning a strong man, a warrior, a term used in the book of First Enoch of the famous Nephilim. We note that first it was Bathsheba who seduced David. And like the watchers of old, David looked down saw a beautiful foreign woman, took her, and mated with her. And if that were not enough, David then plotted to have Uriah die in war. And as the Nephilim of old, Bathsheba's first child died. Well, by way of summary then from this lesson, we learn that the effects of the watcher's sin endure to every generation. These effects also plagued Israel's lineage. However, in each case where the woman converted to Yahweh, he saved her and her descendants. And Boaz himself illustrates how a godly Israelite redeemer can reverse the effects of the watcher's sin, then Matthew's genealogy connects Jesus himself to the Enochian template by mention of these four women, underscoring this precious fact. Humanity needs a powerful redeemer. Should you choose to continue in this study, please read in the book Reversing Hermon Chapter 6, The Watcher's Sin and Jesus' Ministry.